Welcome back to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference, empowering the good. And we love having Gray Holden come on, filling you with good content, information on insurance, risk management, cyber, so much more. Let's kick it off. Gray Holden is Managing Director and Specialty Lines National Practice Leader with Higginbotham. How are you doing, Gray? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me this morning. Absolutely. So let's start out with a little bit about Higginbotham and then we'll dive into your world. Give us some background on Higginbotham. Certainly. So, you know, as we have have come a long way since 1948, when we first started in the last five or six years, we've, you know, expanded from a large agency just in the state of Texas now to 15 states and almost 80 offices across the predominantly the southeast part of the U.S., and uh, with that expansion, it's allowed us to really bring in some pretty high specialization with a number of new partners that might have a, a unique feature with an industry group or a particular product group and allow our clients that are with those folks to experience a broader uh, perspective of what Higginbotham can do from a from a you know an account rounding, if you will, uh, from benefits to property and casualty or property and casualty to life insurance and those types of things. So obviously PNC, property and casualty, employee benefits, personal lines, and then just like you're talking about going super deep and so much more. And so give us a little bit of your specialization when you talk about cyber, DNO, describe what DNO means. Give us a little bit of your world. Yeah, absolutely. And so I have the the pleasure of working with all of our offices across the country with regards to complex accounts that need directors and officers liability, employment practices liability, cyber, commercial crime, those types of things. What we focus on predominantly is anything in the management liability, professional liability, and cyberspace. Uh, professional liability can be everything from you know normal licensed professionals like uh, architects and engineers, uh, all the way down to healthcare related entities, medical professional liability, those types of things. I have a group of team members that specialize in those types of programs. Um, directors and officers liability, employment practices, ERISA liability, those types of things would fall in our management liability or executive lines category. And uh, th those are really geared towards helping protect the personal assets of executives of corporations from breach of fiduciary duty type allegations, whether it be fiduciary duty to the constituents of your business or to participants in your employee benefit plan. Those are the types of coverages that we're really putting together to protect those executive teams. And then of course, cyber cuts across all industries today. Everybody's operating on the internet at some level and we have seen a significant increase. I think the numbers, the latest numbers I saw at year end were a 220% increase in incidents from 2020 to 2022 uh, with regards to not only data breach, which you know is loss of data, uh, but also with regards to ransomware and extortion demands that are, are impacting our clients these days. And that's why we love having you come on is talking about where we are and what needs to be done, offering tips and recommendations and being helpful. And so let's go ahead and, and start with a little bit of a broad overview. When you look at where we are within the insurance marketplace, obviously related to the things that we're talking about, where are we in this moment? Sure, sure. So we're coming out of an extremely hard market for the property and casualty program, specifically casualty over the last two years, you know, 2020, 2021, uh, really were a, a move to heavy, heavy rate pressures, tightening underwriting standards and those types of things. And on the liability side, especially if there was auto liability uh, exposure involved, we were seeing multiples of, of programs. So doubling, tripling, quadrupling of premiums. That's subsided a little bit, um, except for heavy auto exposure. We still are seeing some rate pressure there. Uh, what's taken its place is property. And with the natural disasters that we've had over the last 18 months from wildfires to floods to hurricanes, uh, the property market has, has taken it in the chin, if you will, from a profitability perspective. The reinsurance treaty renewals in January of this year were up on average over 40%. And so we're expecting those rate increases for the reinsurance market to flow down to our customers at the, at the you know, grassroots level. On the management liability side, cyber continues to be a pressure. Uh, we're not seeing as much as we had in prior year. And I think part of that's due to a lot of the education and support that we've put out there 
I think some of our earlier discussions have been really focusing on, you know, the fact you have to have multi-factor authentication and endpoint detection and response systems to really even get a quote, uh, much less a fair quote. Um, we have seen many of our clients implement those types of uh, controls and protocols, as well as, as others across the industry. So it's making the underwriters a little more comfortable with regards to their front end security procedures. So while we're still seeing some rate pressure there, it's not as high as it was. Um, you know, a year or two ago, we were seeing 60 to 100 percent rate pressure in the cyber market. Today, that's probably more in the 20 to 40 percent range. Talk about now how you're able to package things together to be creative, innovative. When you talk about increases over here and, you know, when you talk about properties, it's it's also obviously the catastrophic circumstances with the hurricanes and the fires and those, but it's also the cost to rebuild. And so when you look at supply chain shortages and some of those pieces, it goes on both sides. Talk about on your end how you're able to then help the client, the companies kind of minimize and, you know, and, and come out on the affordable side. So talk about creative packaging now. Sure, sure. So there, there is leverage as, as you look at most of these markets and any of our major brands, if you will, you know, Chubb, Travelers, Hartford, and there, I could name 50 more um, that people would recognize in the marketplace. If, if they have more premium dollars flowing through the program, whether it's a management liability package or a commercial package, if we have the ability to put those programs together with one underwriter, not only does that avoid some potential gaps between you know, what one carrier is providing versus another, because oftentimes claims will span more than one policy, uh, it gives them enough premium volume for them to look at the account in a macro level. And so they're not just looking at one sliver of coverage saying, okay, if I'm only writing the property, I have to look at being profitable, you know, at least four out of five years on this. And so the rate needs to be this high. Um, if we can add the workers comp, which is a very soft market right now, if we can add the, the liability packages and possibly even some management liability coverage in there, that gives them more premium dollars from a comfort perspective. And they're now looking or, or have always looked at it kind of in a, in a global sense on profitability of a particular client or account over time. You mentioned the cyber risk and the multi-factor authentication <clears throat> and some of those pieces that are now becoming standardized in a good way, obviously. Talk about some of the other internal controls that companies need to have in place to be able to be effective with marketing their renewals. Sure. So specific to cyber, the other one that we are seeing a whole lot of is what you know whatever the internal control is it needs to be a stated policy and procedure right and and not just word of mouth it needs to be written it needs to be communicated and employees need to be trained so probably the two major pieces i've seen uh, have an impact in that from an underwriting perspective this year have been you know dedicated employee training uh, whether that be as as elaborate as phishing tests that that can go out to various employees which many people probably have seen um, all the way to, you know, really putting together the, the specifics to understand what happens if someone sends us an email that says we need to change our payment instructions to a particular vendor, for, for example. So that dual authentication or dual channel authentication to validate. What so. catches your attention in terms of some of these <clears throat> trends and things in a good way. So in other words, where we're headed with this, what's something that has your attention in a good way for safety, for cyber, for companies being protective? Well, I think, you know, awareness is, is the biggest thing, right? That, you know, two years ago, people understood what cyber was, they were aware of it, but most people hadn't been affected. And now today, you know, when you look at the statistics, I think the numbers were close to 80% that had uh, of companies had experienced some sort of cyber risk event or cybersecurity event over the last 18 months. So once someone's gone through that, they certainly don't want to go through that again, but also they want to be prepared to have the security measures, the third party vendors and the insurance partners in place to help them respond to a potential loss. And so I think as we've grown in this market over the last 18 months, more and more people are becoming aware of what resources are available to help them both on the front end from a mitigation perspective and on the back end 
from an insurance and, and risk management response perspective. You've touched on this in a past interview, but I think it's important to mention again, if something does happen, obviously, you know, you want to have the partnership in place and the insurance <laughs> in place, but talk about if something does happen, the, the process a company needs to go through in terms of notifying the parties, not necessarily paying the ransom, like all that kind of stuff. So talk about what needs to happen. Certainly. And so I'll, I'll hit this with assuming someone that has insurance in place, right? I know there's risk with that, but let's take that scenario. So the, the the key number one step, if we have an insurance program in place, is for a company to have a a disaster plan and a response plan with the number one item of let's call the insurance company, right? I don't want them to call me because that's going to delay things. Call the insurance company. There's a hotline on our policies. Um, get those forensic analysts engaged in your systems to try to help the company recover. Then call me or simultaneously have someone call me to say, hey, Gray, we have a problem. I can help from a claims management perspective. I can't help from the disaster response perspective. And that's the most important thing. From there, really, again, it goes back to developing response plans. Um, many of our larger clients have started holding tabletop exercises to outline, okay, if this happens, what do we do? They go through an exercise and they figure out where they would have tripped and fallen, put a put a gap in that measure or, or put a measure for that gap and are in a better place today, understanding that they, you know, at least have a plan in place. No, no plan is perfect, right? But at least if you have one, we've got some opportunities on knowing who we call. Talk about excess, there's, you know, umbrellas and all sorts of other things that you can layer on that are um, really important to talk about. So talk about excess layer capacity. Today, excess capacity is, is as high as we've seen it. And I'll kind of break it down in, in three tranches. Um, the, while the primary property is, is extremely expensive, we've got high wind and hail deductibles and those types of things. As you get up the excess ladder, there's still plenty of capacity available. It is a little more expensive than it was, but it's not uh, what we're seeing on the primary. From a casualty perspective, as I mentioned, we're exiting that hard, hard market that we had a couple of years ago, and we're seeing more capacity flow into the into the play into uh, into play. So, I would say certainly excess of 10 million. We've got you know plenty of capacity available. In the DNO space, uh, it is as aggressive as I've seen it in a decade. And so primary, uh, especially for publicly traded companies, is still relatively tight, pretty strict on the underwriting features. But as we get outside that first five or 10 million on, the, on what I would call the working layer of, the, of a publicly traded account, we're seeing some pretty aggressive rate uh, approaches overall. And we've seen a, an influx of capacity. Uh, in the cyber, we've started seeing a pretty good influx of capacity from what I would call our fintech markets. And so many of those are, are run by MGAs. Um, they're, they're seeing some opportunities to come into this market when the pricing is up. Um, our, our traditional brick and mortar brand name, you know, blue blood companies have backed off a little bit on, on offering high limits of cyber. And these these fintech markets have stepped in and are really being aggressive on particular programs, especially if they have the proper controls in place. Give me one more thing that is, um, you know, a, a new trend and innovation, something that, you know, is a, a new policy, if you will. Like what's something that you think, hey, the public needs to know about this. This is something I think that's exciting or, or coming, you know, pretty soon. You know, I think really where we're looking today is is more not necessarily new policies, but new approaches to old policies. And that has to do a lot with, you know, what's driving rates in property, for example. You know, many of our clients are having to look at alternative solutions for how they're managing those property retentions or how they're managing that risk. Similarly, on the um, casualty side, you know, general liability, auto liability and work comp predominantly. Uh, we're seeing more and more markets look at captive options, um, looking whether that be a single parent captive, which is fairly large and complex with a lot of upfront investment, all the way down to what we would call a, a rent a captive or a, uh, a residual type plan. So there's a lot of different things that are coming into play there. Similar, you know, approach, right? The client taking on more risk on the on the front end 
so that they can save some premiums on the back end. Uh, again, not new products, but but new uses of existing products and new new ways to look at the existing products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think just, you know, it forces the hand of creativity in some cases. And so it's like, okay, how could we be creative? How can you, you know, still handle your risk tolerance and do what needs to be done mm-hmm. at the same time, be creative so that financially we can get you where you need to go together and, and manage mm-hmm. through it. And so the creativity around this is, I think, just something that, uh, you know, the more we talk about it, the more dots people can connect and realize, hey, okay, there's an opportunity there. So where do we go to carry these conversations forward? So mention website, your contact information, where do we go? Certainly. So Higginbotham.com is our corporate website. Uh, you can reach me either through that or my email is gholden at Higginbotham.com uh, or Higginbotham.net. Both of those are live. Uh, my mobile number is the easiest way to reach me, and that's 405-406-6145. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Absolutely. So Higginbotham.com, Higginbotham.net, easy places to reach out and learn more. Gray, thank you. You're always a wealth of information. Appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a great day.